very much, Mr. Klauber, for accepting this interview. It is an honor for me and my community of readers to have the opportunity to send you our questions. From my blog, many families have been able to learn about Waldorf pedagogy and how it is part of our family lifestyle. But there are many doubts and questions that come to me every day. So I try to show with this interview a small account of the frequently asked questions that come to me daily. Thanks again. I hope to meet you and talk to you personally one day. We live in a time when information is just a click away, in which the school no longer has the unique function of being a transmitter of knowledge. Nowadays, children learn more on YouTube than at school. This is a reality. So, what should the school contribute to? That is, what is the school for today? Right. <laughs> Okay. I think the function of a school we must, has to be rethought. It can't continue as it has been for the last hundreds of years. It really, we're living in, with an anachronistic concept of what a school could be. A school is really a network of relationships. In fact, you create the school each day. When, by the people who enter the school, whether students or staff or teachers, the relationships are recreated every day. A school is not a fixed thing. We often imagine an institution to be somewhat stable, but a school is a multiplicity of relationships between people. And in that, if we take that concept further, we can then see that it can change, it can evolve. In fact, one knows as a teacher Every child that comes into a class changes the class. Every family that enters or leaves a school changes the school. Each teacher that comes and goes changes the colleague group in the school. So it's always undergoing a metamorphosis, at least on that level. Now with the modern technological advances, I don't think it makes the schools redundant, but I think it makes the question of relationships more important because you can get the information at a click, that's true. You can find the information on YouTube or anywhere. The difficulty is, is knowing if it's true information or whether you're being manipulated. Uh, and I think what the schools can do is help the students and the young people develop a relationship, an understanding of how to use knowledge to question it to look behind it, to look at where it comes from. See, in a school it's simple, it comes from the teacher, and you see the teacher in front of you every day. And you can see by the teacher's gestures, their facial expressions, their body language, uh, the way they walk or the way they dress. You make some interpretation of the validity of what they're telling you in school. Difficulty is on the internet, it's anonymous, it comes from all over, and that's difficult to judge. So the schools can balance that by create, helping the students and young people create a relationship to the knowledge they're receiving and therefore be able to use it wisely. And that's the key thing. Information is fine, but it's what you do with it that actually counts. And so the schools have to really transform themselves into places of experience, experiential education, using the technology in a healthy and wise way that the children then can grow up being able to utilize it and not be used by it. However, at an earlier age, children are being schooled. What does a small child need to find in a school, especially during the first seven years? I think the child in the first seven years needs to find love and care and freedom to be themselves, to play, to run, to laugh, to sing, to dance. It's not having to learn academic subjects. There's a myth that the earlier you learn academic subjects, the cleverer you will be and you'll end up a university professor. It's completely false. 
young, little children do not have to learn academically because when they're ready, they'll catch up extremely quickly. But by pushing academics and formal learning too early, you in fact rob them of their childhood. You're taking away something where one should allow them to fully enjoy being a child. And all that involves a sense of wonder, a sense of imagination, all these qualities, and to live in a world that for them is a joy. And that's why I think in early education, we have to provide that for them and not worry that what if they can't read at this age or write at that age. It's well known, in fact, that children who learn to read and write later actually become better at it and enjoy reading books. It's no longer just an obligation. It's something you have to take pleasure in. And if you, get, if you haven't started at three or four, by the age of nine, you can't tell the difference anyway when they learn to read or write. So I think the early years are respect for childhood, looking at what the qualities of childhood are, are and respecting each individual child for what they bring. And the children are looking, of course, for security. They're looking for warmth. They're looking for understanding. And I think that's early years, is creating the chance for that. And one important element, I think, is free play. Trust the child to play, because then they exercise. We know that play is a real foundation of psychological health. It's a foundation of brain development. It's, con it's a foundation for social competence in child's play. And there should be a space for that. And it shouldn't be taken away by rigid, sort of determined, determined, you must learn this, because if you don't do it now, you won't get on in life. Government policies are contradictory in this because it's well known, in fact, what I'm saying is not a sort of new age or avant-garde, it's clearly established. But schools have a sort of conservative, education is a conservative profession. And it's understandable, people feel secure with what they know. Politicians have been brought up in one way and they assume that is the way to continue because they don't know any different themselves. Because in developing in the way I've described, there is an element of entering into the new, taking a risk, trusting the child. Uh, and most people feel, oh dear, something will go wrong. And therefore we had developed policies that are sort of set in stone. But they really do not meet the needs of the children of today. They met the needs of the children yesterday and in the past, but they won't meet the needs of the children in the future. It needs a complete rethink, but it needs a courage and a willing to step beyond boundaries. The problem with educational policy is that ministers of education do not keep that job very long. We know in England that the average of a minister of education is two years in that position only two years. So they get their feet under the table. They want to present something to be remembered by. They make a program, then they disappear. And the next one does the same, and the following one does the same. So there's no real continuity or understanding of what is happening in our schools. Added to that, we've got the pressure of economics. Yeah. One of the biggest institutions in affecting uh, change or affecting schools is the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. Economic cooperation. And we're finding now that schools are being marketized. This sense of competition, of, of accountability, all these things are part of a market mentality. And again, that's to create a security, which is understandable, but on the other hand, prevents evolution. Children in their most important years of life, how should the 
religious preparation need? The tendency in teacher training in our age is to learn didactics. You learn how to teach a subject. Child development is not really considered important. And that's very strange, because children do have stages of development that we all go through when we were children. There, are, there is a human pattern on how the brain develops, how, how bodies develop, which is a, a rhythm that all children, unless they are hurt or abused, follow. And yet that is not seen as an undercurrent of teacher training. And this is actually disrespect for the child because you have to present things to the child that is appropriate to their development. So I think with teacher training, we have to open it all up to the arts, that the teachers learn what it means to be uh, human and to learn to express themselves, not just didactically by in input, by presenting knowledge that the children have to learn, but learn to be with the children, to learn to relate to the children, to what they want, what they bring, what they need, what their families need into the classroom. And this is a specific skill. And one way to do that is use the arts during teacher training. It used to be like that. In Denmark, for instance, teacher training was 50% art activity. Dance, music, drama, theatre, all sorts of things. 50%. They drifted away from that. Now they've drifted back because they can see that improves the quality of the teachers. And the same in places like Finland, which scores very highly in all educational sort of assessments. They use the arts in tr for teacher training. So the young teachers begin to find a way of life in themselves that helps them relate to the child and their task. Bangkok outdoor schools are often, con often considered uh, utopic schools uh, where children live in a very careful environment but away from real life. And many families later worry about how their children can integrate uh, into the society properly. This is undoubtedly one of the most frequent questions that uh, come to me. What do you consider of this? This question keeps coming back, and one can see why, because it's not conventional, it's different. Parents have to make a choice. They have to step out of what is considered normal. They get difficult questions. You know, from their neighbours, from their friends. Of course, that's not easy. But on the other hand, it is real life. What do you define as real life? Isn't real life having a, 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 a connection to the environment? Isn't real life about wanting to know about each other and sharing things with other people? Re real life is a funny idea that real life is only competition. Because we know the most important human attribute that we share together is cooperation. That's what makes the world better. That's what makes our life better. That makes us happier. That en enables us to find abilities in ourselves we didn't know we existed. Co competition narrows us down as human beings. We want to be better than them. Whatever level that is, whether it's business, individual, city to city, nation to nation, it excludes. We need to be inclusive. We want to work with the deep problems our world faces on so many different levels. We can only do it through cooperation. The problems are far too big for a small community, even a nation, to solve. We are, live in a world that is interdependent. We need each other, but to work with each other and understand each other, these are important skills. That is real life, <laughs> but it can also be developed in school with children. Those moral qualities, those humane human qualities can be worked, of, worked in school as well as them learning and getting all the knowledge 
but they need to be citizens of the world. Of course they need to know things that everyone else knows. But the question is in, how do you teach it? And what lies behind the teaching, which the children can also absorb, so they can go into the world confident, imaginative, creative, and able to work with others. That is what I call real life.